British Columbia, so I'm not used to any of the customs that you may have. Um, but uh, I'm from Los Angeles, California. My name is Hamza Abdullah. So if I'm doing something wrong, uh, someone just kind of point this way, that way, or just say, brother, you're doing that wrong, and I would truly appreciate it. But um, my name is Hamza Abdullah, uh, retired NFL player. Um, played seven years in the National Football League. American football. Um, I don't know what you guys call football, but we play American football in America uh, in the National Football League. Um, I played seven years, four for the Broncos, or three and a half, and three for the Arizona Cardinals. And I retired in 2011. Uh, during 2011, uh, my younger brother, Hussein Abdullah, who also played seven years, he played for the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, he got a concussion. Uh, many of you may know concussions now, uh, but concussions at that time, they weren't really wide known, uh, but their hits to the head, he was knocked out, and he had to go in what's called injured reserve, so he had to miss some time um, during his football season. So while he was on his football, while he was sitting at home during his football season, there were a number of things that happened in his life, and at the end of the season, he said, Hamza, we should go for Umrah. I had just wrapped up my seventh uh, professional year in the NFL, and it was a contract situation for me, a contract year. And in a contract year, as an NFL player, it's your big money year. It's the year that you're going to make the most money, inshallah. Um, it's what you work towards when you're a little kid and you say, hey man, when I do this and I'm going to get my mom a house and I'm going to do this and that and X, Y, and Z, that was what I was facing. Hussein was also on a contract year, and, but he wanted to go for Umrah. So we decided to go for Umrah um, during free agency. So you got, I don't know how familiar you guys are with sports. Uh, you, you understand it? Very familiar? Okay, good. Okay, so the first days of free agency are very important because the teams have their, they have a list of guys of who they want. And, you know, hopefully you're always, you know, you're always wishing that you're on the top of the list. But they want to see you. They want to fly you to these different cities. They want to, what's so-called, wine and dine you, take you to nice restaurants and hotels. And then they want to offer you these contracts. Well, Hussein wanted to go for Umrah at the time that free agency started. You know, I'm asking him, like, you know, okay, well, I, I do want to go for Omla, but at the same time, you know, let's let's secure a, a future. You know, let's get our contracts. He was adamant. He said, no, let's go for Omla. So we went for Omla, and when we went for Omla, mashallah, it was our first time going for Omla. It was life changing. Um, sitting in South Central Los Angeles, which we're we're from, you don't really get a chance to see the signs of Allah, like the Kaaba. The, I mean the signs that are in the Quran. You know, obviously we can look outside and see trees. We see snow right now. That's a sign of Allah. But the Kaaba, when I was younger, was just a portrait on the wall or something on the on the Salat rug. So to actually go to Saudi Arabia, go to Mecca, and to see this beautiful building, the most beautiful place in the world, and the feeling that I got, it, it captivated me. It was something more. And we left that Umrah trip, coming back to our free agency time, and our agent was saying, you know, uh, teams aren't really calling you guys as much as I thought. Um, I still had the Arizona Cardinals, uh, which is the team I was playing for at the time. My brother Hussein had the Minnesota Vikings, his team at the time, but not too many other teams. So Hussein, so we went back to working out, preparing for our next season, and then Hussein called me about a week later and said, Let's go for Hajj. And I said, <laughs> uh, excuse me? He said, yes, let's go for Hajj. I said, Hussein, Hajj is in October. And if we go for Hajj, we probably can't play in the, in the season. So we have to kind of take the season off. He said, no, you know, we'll be able to, we'll go for Hajj, and then we'll work out real hard, and then we'll come back. They'll understand. And he kept telling me, Hamza, just trust the law, trust the law, trust the law. I said, okay. So after some time, after istikhara and after dua, we made our intentions to go for Hajj. And mashallah, we, we had an opportunity to go for Hajj. We took our parents, 
uh, my older brother, Abbas, and Hussein's wife. So it was six of us, and we went for Hajj. And when we came back, uh, we were under the impression that we would be working out to go back to the NFL. There were still about seven or eight weeks left in the season, and I had been out before longer than that and came back to a team. So, you know, I thought this was old hat. I can do this. Uh, no one called. So we went the whole 2012 season off, and we came back the Super Bowl February of 2013, and alhamdulillah, Hussein got a call. The Kansas City Chiefs called my brother, they said, Hussein, we'd like for you to come work out, and we're going to sign you to a contract. So, Allahu Akbar. So, Hussein was back in the NFL, and I was still waiting. Alhamdulillah, that's the first domino. The next domino falls in line, that will be me. That call for me never came. And when it didn't come, I, had, I was faced with my new reality. Who is Hamza Abdullah? Because I'm sure if you guys have read the pamphlet or the program, any introduction that I hear or see, it says Hamza Abdullah, the NFL player. Well, what do you call a football player that doesn't play football? You don't. So I was sitting at home waiting for a phone call that would never come. So I suffered an identity crisis. I didn't know who I was. Who is Hamza Abdullah? And I went deep, deep, deep into despair. I went into depression, and I didn't know how to get out of it. Because since I was 12 years old, I had been playing football. I had woken up every single day to be the best football player that I could be. Football in my life was number one. And in any professional, I would say, you know, being a doctor, a lawyer, these high-level professions in the military, professional athlete, you have to wake up every single day with that on your mind. If you're not getting better at that, then you're getting passed up by someone else who is getting better at that. So the NFL was my lifeline. It was what I did every single day since I was 12 years old. But now at the age of 28, I'm, I don't have anything. I'm undone. And at my lowest point, I didn't know. I said, you know, there's no, there's no reason for me to live. I was sent here on this earth to play football. That's what I felt. I was sent here to play football. But I kept making go. I said, this, this isn't right. And I started getting phone calls and text messages from some of my old teammates. And they were going through the same thing. In 2012, five former players, retired NFL players, or current players commit suicide. They shot themselves. They got into car accidents. They overdosed. And I wondered if that was going to be me too. So I had to take a step back and I had to look in my life. I had to look in the eyes of my children, look into my wife, and ask the law, what am I here for? Football was my identity. But then at my lowest low, I was on a knee and I was crying. And I reached up. And what I found was the rope of Allah. I found Imam Nawawi's 40th hadith was sitting on my nightstand. And I picked it up and I opened it. It says Imam Nawawi's 40th, 40th hadith. I didn't know it went to 42. And the 42nd hadith said, O son of Adam, were you to come to me with sins as great as the earth, but you do not associate any partner with me, then I will forgive you. And when I read that, I knew that that was a sign from Allah, that I was here for a reason. And so I had to get up, I had to dust myself off, and I had to see that that was a preparation for me. I had to go through that. The reason I had to go through that was because the people that I meet now, now I can relate to this person, I can relate to this brother or this sister or this child or this elder because I've been down that road. It may not be exactly what you went through, but I was down, I was out. I felt there was nothing left. There was nothing left for me to live for. I had played football, I was supposed to die a football player. 
But Allah showed me, no. As far as you wanted to go with football, you wouldn't go nearly as much uh, in Islam or as a Muslim. And that was evidence to me actually last week, myself and my younger brother Hussein were at the RIS conference in Toronto. And here we are speaking in front of a room of 15,000 people simply because we're a Muslim. Not because we're football players, but because we're a Muslim. So I understood that my what I had to do was I had to tackle these tough issues. Um, I had to talk about depression. I had to talk about mental illness, mental health. And as I did my studying, I found that these were topics that we weren't discussing. Number one, I'm a male. We don't talk about depression as males. We don't talk about our feelings. You know, if someone is crying, they say, oh, you're, you're a sissy. But we have to debunk that. We have to get that out. As an African-American male, we definitely don't talk about it. As a professional athlete, we don't talk about it. And then, of course, as Muslims, we don't talk about it. And when I say we don't talk about it, I don't mean the... There are a number of groups, mashallah, that are doing some great work, but I mean in the totality, the whole thing. As a Muslim Ummah, when do we sit down and discuss our feelings? And that's what I'm here for. My life purpose, I found, is to leave a lasting legacy of loving for your brother and sister what you love for yourself. I pray that long after I'm gone, with a day, a week, five years, 10 years, 50 years, whatever it is, when people say my name, I pray that they will say, he loved for his brother and sister what he loved for himself. So when we sit and we say, assalamu alaikum, we're saying assalamu alaikum because we're spreading peace. That's a sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi And we're trying to see, just, we're spreading peace. We're someone to say, hey, Kif Malik, how are you doing? How are you doing? and meaning it. Because when I ask you how you're doing, when I ask you how you're doing, I mean it. I want to know, how are you doing? Because there were days when I wasn't feeling so great. There were days that I wasn't able to go to the masjid. There were days that I would sit in my room and not come out. I know those days. And we all, some of us in here may have had a day like that today, or yesterday, or last week. Or we may know someone going through that right now. Love for your brother and sister what you love for yourself. If you have a friend that you know all of a sudden they're not in the group chat, or you don't see them on Facebook, or you don't see them coming to the masjid, check on them. Send them salams. Go to their house. Knock on the door. Give them a hug. Even if they don't tell you what's going on, just give them a hug. Just know that you're, they're there. Because all we need to know is that someone cares. Part of the reason that we, as human beings, I know for me personally, um, doing my studies with other NFL players, because in what I did during these last three years, I did a lot of research. I reached out to a lot of other NFL players. And the number one reason for depression, the number one reason um, that we feel the way that we do is because we think we're alone. So many of us in here may have felt, oh, man, I, I feel like I'm alone. I feel like no one understands what I'm going through. No one understands Hamza. The reality is that there are many of us going through that same thing. We just have to open up our minds and our hearts and our eyes to see it. When you see a brother, you see a sister, you may not know her, you may not know him. Give them salams. Give them a hug. Tell them you miss them, tell them you love them, tell them you want to see them. Because that may be the difference between them harming themselves, harming someone else, having a good day, having a bad day. And, you know, these are hardships. I may go to this brother, I may say, Assalamu alaikum, he may say, Hamza, thank you. No one has given me salams at this masjid. This is a new masjid for me. I moved here two weeks ago from California, and no one had given me salams. And today, I said, if no one gives me salams, I'm going to leave. We, we don't know what the next brother or the next sister is going through. And it's our job as Muslims 
to be the best that we can be. Because we're always being, we're always being represented as Muslims. So one of the topics they wanted to discuss was the media. Well, as the media, the media is always a broad stroke. For me, when I do something, I can be, it could be all black people, it could be all NFL players, it could be all Muslims, it could be all fathers. So I'm always representing these things every single time that I walk outside the house, everything that I do. But I like when people say Hamza associate me with being a Muslim because I'm trying to live love for my brother and sister what I love for myself. I wouldn't mind if they painted a broad stroke like that, said, no, I know Muslims and they love for their brother and sister what they love for themselves. So that's what I've found over these last three years. Loving for your brother and sister what you love for yourself. That's the bottom line to everything. Think about anything that you're going through right now. Anything at work, at school, in your family life. Am I loving for my brother and sister what I love for myself? Me and my wife are arguing. I brought my wife here today. We may be arguing. I have to take a step back and say, am I, am I seeing it from her point of view? Am I loving for my wife what I love for myself? Me and my son, we may be at odds about something. I take a step back. Am I seeing it from his point of view? Am I loving for my son what I love for myself? And for me, what I've understood is I'm at, I have a platform different than you know, a lot of you in here. But we are, each, we each are blessed with a platform that Allah has blessed us with. Allah has blessed us all with a gift, but he has also given us a task. And we will not pass away until we complete that task. So I truly believe that my task is to leave a lasting legacy of loving for your brother and sister what you love for yourself. And so what I have been doing these last three years is writing my memoir, my book, about my transition from the NFL to what we call civilian life in the NFL. And in that, I pray that it leaves a guide or a book to point people in the right direction, to say, I've been where you've been. I've been down, I've been out. Where I thought there was no reason for me to live, literally. I live, I'm, I'm standing here today telling you, I thought there was no reason for me to live. There's nothing, for what? For what? For what? I'm married, I have four children, I have a mother who loves me, yet still, I couldn't see a reason for living. I didn't get it, I didn't understand it. I was doing well financially, I, I was living in a nice place, but for some reason, I just, there was nothing there for me, as though I, that's what I felt. But I had to be, I, I needed that for a reminder that Allah is always with us. Regardless of what you're going through, brothers and sisters, Allah is with you. And even though I may not have seen it, my brother saw it, my sister saw it, my wife saw it, my daughter saw it, and so they're there as reminders for us. So as I'm writing my book, and now, alhamdulillah, I just finished going and doing speaking engagements, I encounter a lot of different brothers and sisters from all walks of life. And they always ask me, well, what did you learn? What did you learn? You know, you guys went for a hatch. What did you learn? Because you left, you know, you left the NFL lifestyle. You left, you know, everything that you think of the NFL. It's, it's true. I'll be honest with you. Whatever you think of the NFL, that whatever you're thinking, it's true. It's there. It's at your fingertips. It's a test. Whatever you're dealing with, it's a test. It's a test to see if you're going to rely on the law and the law alone. And on the cover of my book, it's titled Hamza Abdullah, Come Follow Me. On the cover of my book, I have a staff like Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he had his staff. And Allah asked him, you know, yeah Musa, what is that? Well, this is my staff. I lean on it, you know, I tend my sheep with it. He knew his staff. And then what did Allah tell him? Throw it. He threw it, it becomes a serpent. 
And he had fear in his heart. And Allah told him, don't fear. Don't have fear. What I found in our life, we all are going to have, we all have a staff in our hand. For me, it was football. That was the thing that I knew, that I loved, that you couldn't tell me anything about it. Football was my staff. And Allah told me to throw it. And when I first let go is when I had an identity crisis. But Allah told me, don't fear. Grab hold of it. And now control it. And now I'm going to use that. I'm going to give it back to you. And now you're going to use it to spread the message. We all have a staff in our life, whatever it is. Be a doctor, a lawyer. You might be a mother at home. You may be a reaver. And your whole family is your staff. Allah Alam. But trust in Allah. Allah is merciful. So what did I learn? Allah is merciful. We just have to believe in it and understand it. Allah is merciful. Allah wants us to win. He wants us to win. It's not a trick question. Life is not a trick question. Allah is not trying to catch us up on a formality. He wants us all to go into Jannah, inshallah. And inshallah, we will be there. But we have to understand that this is a test. And it's an open book test. And it's a test that we can ask our neighbor about. We don't have to do it alone. And we can't do it alone. I tried. Many of us have tried. We've tried to do it alone. It doesn't work that way. Life is the ultimate team sport. They say football is the ultimate team sport. No, life is the team sport. Because when I'm put into the ground, I can't make dua for myself anymore. But all of my brothers and sisters can. They can ask Allah to have mercy on me. We need those duas. As brothers and sisters, we need them. And to circle all the way back, because I was very selfish when it came to going for Hajj. I was very selfish. I didn't want to go. At first I was like, man, you know, I'm going to lose out on this money. $1.5 million US, not Canadian. <laughs> That's a big difference. But I'm going to lose out on this money. I was very selfish. Stop for long and Allah forgive me. But Alhamdulillah made dua, made istikhara, asked Allah to guide me. Allah, here I am. La beik Allahumma la beik. Here I am, my Lord, here I am. Whatever you want me to do, I will do wholeheartedly. Go for Hajj. Take your parents with you. And it wasn't until January 2nd, 2016, so it's almost been a year, that I realized why we went for Hajj or we made the decision to go for Hajj, March 20th, 2012. January 2nd, 2016, my father, my stepfather, but the man who raised me as my father passed away. He's a Haji. May Allah have mercy on him. But it wasn't until I was in the banquet hall after we had buried him that I realized why we had to go for Hajj right then and there. Because if we had not went then, I probably would have signed a contract, maybe three years, four years, and I would have been saying, next year we'll go for Hajj, next year we'll go for Hajj. But then my father, Brother Yusuf, may Allah have mercy on him, Maybe he would have already been gone. So now, when I look at my father, Brother Yusuf, I know that, inshallah, Allah will have mercy on him, and inshallah, you know, he has passed away at Haji. So Haj my bro, inshallah. So sometimes, we don't know why we're going through that test. And it can be very expensive tests. We don't know why. But Allah's wisdom, Allah's plan is 100%. Allah's plan always comes through. Allah is not trying to trick us. Allah is the most merciful of the ones who show mercy. So if someone is merciful, 
you know, we think that we're merciful to our kids, but Allah's mercy blows that out the water. And we have to understand that. And I know there's some young brothers here, young sisters here. If you take anything away from this, number one is Allah is merciful. Allah is merciful. Anything that you want to do, know that you can do it as long as it goes with what Allah has planned for you. Because I wanted to be a basketball player, but Allah didn't have that in my cards. I played football. And now I'm here speaking, you know, going to different countries and able to speak with different gatherings with brothers and sisters because that was Allah's mercy on me. And Allah is forever merciful. There's no limit to Allah's mercy. That's what we have to understand. In America, it's, it's a capitalist society. There's only one house. There's only one job. There's only one car. There's only one promotion. Allah doesn't have those boundaries. And it's also this society of, okay, next year I'm going to do this. You know, let's set all of our New Year's resolutions. Allah is not confined to a calendar. We don't have to do that. We don't have to do what everyone else does. We're Muslim. And as a Muslim, you're not meant to fit in. You know, one of the things that people remember about me and my brother were saying about playing in the NFL was fasting during the month of Ramadan. We're fasting during the month of Ramadan. You're not going to stand, you're not going to be the same or you're not going to be looked at the same because you're doing something that not everyone is doing. You're fasting. And so these are the hot summer months, July, August. We're meant to stand out. And we have to always stand out whether it's your praying, your fasting, all of these different things are meant for us to stand out. We don't have to fit in. Because the, I'm going to be honest with you, I, when I was younger, I used to try to, my hardest to fit in. I tried to be in a gang, I tried to do all these different things, hang out with the older people, and they would say, Hamza, you're just not like us. And at first I thought it was a slap in the face. Here, give me a job, I'll do it. They're like, no, this isn't you. But then they respected that I was different from them. They respected that I had to stop playing video games to go pray. They respected that I couldn't drink water at football practice. So you spend all these years or time trying to fit in, and then people hate you more. They actually, they disregard you. But if you stand firm on your deans and say, hey man, this is what I gotta do. I gotta go pray, I gotta take a break. I gotta wear my kufi. You know, at first they may make jokes about it, but after a while, they're going to be defending you. They're going to tell their friends, no, he doesn't eat that. So, as Muslims, we have to always try to stand, stand above, stand out. Because Allah is with us. Allah is merciful. Allah is merciful. And, and I'll end with this. Because I truly want us to understand this as Muslims. To, to me, um, I don't know how many of you guys understand football or watch American football, but the end zone is where everything magical happens. That's where the touchdown dances happen. But the end zone is where everybody wants to be regardless of what position they are. But for us, for me, my ultimate end zone is Jannah. And I don't know if you guys know, but when the whole team, when someone scores a touchdown, like we were coming, we were living in Dallas, and when Ezekiel Elliott, he's the new Cowboys running back, when he scores a touchdown, the whole team runs in there. And everyone is just so happy. So, inshallah, I want us all to get into Jannah and party in the end zone. All of us. Let's have a party in the end zone. But what we have to understand is it's going to be tough. The game of football is tough. Life is tough. There are going to be some times where you go backwards. There are going to be some times where you go side to side. 
There are going to be some times where you have really long plays where you look like you're close and then you get a penalty and have to come back. That's life. But in the game of football, we can't do it alone. One person cannot beat 11 other football players. We we'll have to work together as a team. So I have to lean on my brother and sister to my left and to my right and say, hey, we're going to get into the end zone. We're all trying to get to Jenna. And we're going to do that by loving for our brother and sister what we love for ourselves. When you're on the same team, it's not about the name on the back of the jersey. It's not about the color of the skin. It's not about the dialect that you speak. You're all ha you all have one goal to get to the end zone. So all of us here, we're on the same team, and we're all trying to get to the end zone. But we have to understand every single brother and sister, their strengths and their weaknesses. Understand their strengths so that you can bring those strengths out of each other. Understand those weaknesses so that you can go to those weaknesses and help them. Maybe if he walks like this, you can be underneath him, so now he walks tall. So we have to be a crutch for our brothers and sisters. We have to love for our brother and sister what we love for ourselves. Inshallah, if we all love for our brother and sister what we love for ourselves, we will all be dancing in the end zone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.